All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast. I am your host, Bailey Eigbrett, and as always, joined by my co-host, the captain, Mr. Andy Full. What's going on, dude? Oh, not a whole lot. Um, pretty excited to talk about this uh, today. It's Yeah. I, I think the way we're going to approach this is fairly similar, but since I have a boat, I can cover way more ground. So yeah. advantage boater right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, you know, really. Uh, yeah, as, as you folks can see from the title, uh, and also there's no person mentioned, it's Andy and I tonight, so you guys are stuck with your hosts. Sorry for you. Uh, but no, we have no, no one joining us tonight because Andy and I want to break down this topic uh, because it's actually very interesting when you kind of think of it from a, a philosophical standpoint, but also a strategic standpoint of how the two differ when trying to be efficient. So what we're going to talk about today is kayak versus boat and not talking about the kayak versus boat argument that you see all over the place. Now talking about kayak versus boat in terms of how you break down practice, how you structure your practice to try to be as efficient as possible. Um, basically what we're going to do is Andy and I both have lakes pulled up on our Navionics. Um, and what we're going to do for reference, we're going to have three days of practice. So every example we're going to give, there's going to be three different days of practice that we're going to talk about and how we try to structure those for time management, what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, and also we're going to break it down in four different segments throughout this show. We're going to talk about it in terms of the pre-spawn and the spawn and the summer and the fall. Obviously for you folks down south, uh, there's a winter bite. I'm sure there are winter tournaments. I think there are winter tournaments. Uh Andy and I have zero experience on that, so we're not even going to touch on it because it's just probably going to be a waste of your time because our opinions are more than, more than likely wrong when it comes to fishing the winter in the south. So we're not even going to touch on that. So if that's what you're looking for, we do apologize. Hopefully later on we can get you insight on that from somebody else who does fish down south in the winter. Um, but basically what we're going to do, we're, we're going to dive into it. We're going to start out in the pre-spawn area. We're going to bring up our lakes here, lakes here but we're going to talk real basic here uh, kind of our personal strategies and like what Andy and I want to emphasize too is these are how Andy and I approach our tournament strategy. Uh, you can have completely different approach that works really well for you. Uh, that might help others. Feel free to comment down below. Uh, if you have any tips, pointers, things that you want to add on to what we talk about, or even if you disagree, let us know what you disagree about and Absolutely. why we love that. we love to have that debate. Um, but I think, you know, I'll start us off here, Andy, and I think for me, what I like to do in my practice because of a kayak, and you know, we literally, the, one of the first things you mentioned was uh, advantage to the boater because you can pick up and run wherever the heck you want. Uh, with a kayak, I think the biggest thing that's of most importance throughout your practice, just say you have three days of practice, is dulling down any time possible that you're wasting. Wasting time is the biggest detriment to any kayak angler in a tournament uh, because it does take you the that maximized amount of time to get from a certain area to another area from one spot to another uh you know and in terms of of certain bodies of water or well, where you want to find fish because there, there's basically three different strategies when it comes to practice and it's finding fish uh where you can you know then create like a milk run or there's finding areas where you break you just want to you know you know there's fish there you want to break it down or there's finding patterns where then you can then replicate it somewhere else. Uh, it's it's a lot tougher with a kayak because obviously it takes more time to do that Your versus mobility. in a boat. Limited. Exactly. Absolutely. Mobility is limited. Uh, for me, what I like to do, I like to move as much as possible uh, and try to find as many areas that have fish that I can replicate. And as long as I think that they're very similar, I'll at least in my mind, I'll know that fish are going to set up there very similarly. And I kind of create, try to create a time management system throughout a tournament where I can obviously then make a milk run, but oh, obviously yeah. like we're going to go into for each season, it's going to be different. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Talk to me a little here about your basic. So the way I do everything, like, so every year we find out what lakes we're fishing, right? So the first thing I will do when I find out what lakes are it is, if it's a lake that I already know, um, I just kind of read maps based on what season it is. But if it's a new lake, the first thing I actually do is I Google 
that lake because I want to know what type of bait fish is in that lake and what type what type of vegetation there is. So I'm not coming in just blind what I'm going to be looking for. Like, so you know what kind of bait fish there is. So I'll be like, oh, so are they going to be chasing alewives or golden shiners? Or are they going to be uh, eating bluegill based on the, the season type? And then my second yeah. thing I'll do is actually go to YouTube because YouTube tells you everything, right? Mm -hmm. so you can type in that lake and you can find out by watching five or six videos exactly what people are doing. And you can be like, oh, okay. And now you have little landmark mines in your head, like, oh, that guy caught a six pounder in this general vicinity. So you can kind of circle back to your Navionics app and be like, I think it's here based on this part that I look at here. And then third, <clears throat> it virtually comes down to season and knowing like transition points because I have a boat I can run all over the place. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I use a tiny lake to help pick us down. So. <clears throat> yeah, so that's yeah. my big thing. I want to know what I'm walking into. I don't like going in blind. So based on what the forage is, if there's like lay down trees, that's how I'm rigging to go through my practice. Yeah. I think another tool that not a lot of people use, and I don't think it's going to bite me at all, but using Instagram recent location as you go and type in like, like I've been doing this past week, I'm going and I'm typing in on Instagram and location, Lake Chickamauga, and I'm going to recent seeing what those guys are doing because there's guys in there that put in a lot of information like I used to do. I don't do it anymore. Like saying, oh, like, you know, red rattle trap was on fire today, you know, up on you know certain part. I'm not saying that's exactly what was posted because I'm it, it wasn't. But in that, for example, like they're going to put in some people put in their full details in the background. They show exactly where they are. It can help you key in on certain certain things that are going on, that, which is another piece of the puzzle that helps you not waste time. So mm -hmm. while you're not even on the water, you're already practicing essentially before you even start your first three days on the water. Exactly. Um, now to circle back here, are you a note taker? Like, do you write down water temp condition you're out afterward when you get home, or make like a mental note or voice recording? See, uh. I would take notes, but I'm so bad at keeping all that organized. Uh, if there's something like significant going on that I kind of mentally register uh, when it has those conditions, basically what I do uh, is I compile, I take a screen, I take pictures of my graph of temperatures, time, and then I take a picture of what's in front of me, like mm -hmm. conditions. Um, because uh, you can kind of get a feel for like the time of year and everything, what like Oh, well, especially I'm beyond, like, North, yeah. Right. And then I kind of, what I, all I do is I email it to myself and I save it on my browser and I put it in folders in my actual, like my folder on yeah, that's my very desktop. Smart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I can, I'm pretty good at memorizing a lot of things because in the North, it, where we're at in New York, it generally stays the same from season to season, to season, right? We ice off somewhere at the end of March through first two weeks of April, I would say that's generally when we're able to start mm -hmm. fishing. So we know mm -hmm. in proximity of what the water temps are going to be. So our cycle is the same every year as to where like the guys down South in Texas, they don't experience a two week cold blast, what we normally would do. So I think I would take better notes if I lived down there. So in that situation, if I was able to go out and fish and in 15 years, when it happened again, if I got bit, I can go back and be like, Oh, this is what I did and why I don't think I'll be able to remember 15 years in yeah. 15 years in the uh, future today, like just cause there's so much going on in our modern day world. But I do, I'm very good at mentally notating things <clears throat> and pictures on iPhones, especially you get those time tags. So you can go yeah. back and see the exact date. I always take pictures of baits, the fish that I caught and where, so I can kind of, circle back like oh this is what i did on this date when i went there yeah I, i'm kind of ocd in that. yeah i do the same thing i'm ocd in the fact that with those time cards i will have i have probably 30 different folders on my phone in my photos where i, I organize albums for each lake um that's kind of how i like to go about things for the most part but like i would definitely be much more meticulous when it comes to like a tva system that changes a lot more than like our glacial lakes do mm -hmm. up here uh, that's, I mean, that's a whole different system that is, 
something I'm not I'm not comfortable speaking on because I don't think I have the expertise to. Um, zero. <laughs> yeah. so. But hopefully next after next week I'll walk away with some some more understanding of how everything works. But uh, basically, what we're going to start out with guys. We're going to do. Let's we'll start out with a pre spawn pre spawn time frame. Uh, we're gonna pop, we're, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pop up a share screen here. So if you guys are listening to this episode, I highly encourage you to circle back and kind of see what we're showing on screen. Uh, so let me get rid of this banner right here. Um, and Andy's gonna show his through his phone. But let me share screen. I picked up a random lake. Uh, I think this is Illinois, Lake Shelbyville. So if you're, I'm not saying I'm I'm anyone who's crazy talented at fishing and knowledgeable, but Maybe you might take a point or two if you're from Illinois and you fish Lake Shelby, though. Uh, but it's a super, super interesting lake because it has a lot of different – it's got these channel swings. Like, to the point of there's, they almost look like ledges. Uh, crazy oh, amount of creeks. Definitely some ledges on there. Oh, yeah. Which is interesting to think, you know, ledge fishing in Illinois. Um, so I think how we're going to break this down, Andy, is – bring my – template up here uh so first things we're going to look for we're, we're going to talk about day one in practice right so this is the whole lake here and naturally pre-spawn time you know what's what, what would you think pre-spawn is for illinois like a in april i i'm gonna april? go i'm gonna say it's a little earlier i think march because usually illinois starts getting some bad storms right around march so it's probably a little bit – I'm going to say it's probably two weeks earlier than what we would start seeing. So right. I bet also, their water temps – and it also depends on if it's a nuclear reactor lake, which that one I don't think it is because it's so um, big. But, um, yeah, I would 40, say it's relatively 40, the same time frame as us. 40, let's see. So depths, it looks 45 in here. Let me go look up at the north side real quick. So it is significantly shallower in the north end because what I was going to mention was I'm going to start in the pre-spawn. I'm going to focus more on the south side of the lake mm -hmm. in terms of that's naturally what's going to get warmer faster. But because it's double the depth uh, and it doesn't seem like it's that big of a lake, I can't actually – I think it might be – it's a county long, so it might be pretty big. I can't get a good grasp of how large it is. But uh, I think with how shallow it is up here and that time frame of things warming up, that all these fish out from that main lake will probably push back into that creek. So I think from, from a time frame of what's warming up first, I'm going to check out these creeks and go as far mm -hmm. back as I possibly can. Because that's naturally, unless like you have, um, you know, creeks flowing in from whether it's, you know, on when it has, if it has mountains around it that are have, have creeks flowing from that, uh, I'm trying to think of the term of, of snow. Was it a snow melt? Is that, is snow that melt. Yeah, it's snow melt. Okay. Northerner, you should know. Snow <laughs> but you get my drift. It's like that could that could be something that cools it down. But mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't have that, I mean, backs of these creeks can be significantly warmer than the main lake. So I'm gonna check out something like back up in here. Try to get as far back as I possibly can. Uh, and same, with, likewise with this this eastern branch right here that looks like it has some creeks that go way far back. I mean, yeah, look at this one. That looks juicy. Um, yeah. It almost looks like a has its own little mini lake as part of this branch. Yeah. What is, what is this called? Uh, it's almost like uh, an oxbow. Kas, Kaskia? Kas, Kas, I can't even pronounce that. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's – would you agree or disagree that trying to get as far back in these creeks first thing in pre-spawn is going to be your best approach? I, I, I do agree. Um that's where I think I would look first and I would spend, I don't know if I would go there first thing in the morning, but I would try to find personally, like it depends on water temp. So if we're looking like mid forties to almost 50 degrees, right? So that's mm -hmm. where I'm thinking 45 to 55 degrees. I'm actually going to look for Creek channels that come out of those pockets with quick access to deep water where it's going to come up and it's going to create almost like a flat. So let's see here. Um, go down a little bit. Oh, dude, that's gotta be a great staging area. This bridge so, that leads back into that <laughs> Creek that uh, that's probably loaded. Yeah. So let's, let's start on that bridge. Can you zoom in on that bridge a little bit more? Yes, sir. All right. So where I'm going to start is probably on 
in proximity here because I have to point. So where your mouse is now, move up. See where you have that little cove in the top right? There's a little flat there with flooded timber. So I honestly would probably start somewhere in that flooded timber area. And depending on what's on this bridge. So if you have like big rock riprap, I would mm -hmm. work my way from the flooded timber down to that bridge. Yeah. And and try to intersect them because that's a really good intersection place because there's deep water. You have flooded timber, so you're going to have bluegill or whatever the bait fish is, perch, in that area where they're going to be feeding to get ready to spawn. And if there's shad, shad like to spawn around cover. And if right. it's that time that there's a shad spawn in Illinois, that, that would be a, a very good place. Um, I, it depends on which way does this lake lay? Is it north to south? Uh, you t uh, it looks like it, it almost kind of... In terms of depth, it looks north to south because the south is much deeper. It almost yeah, so, looks like it sets up like a glacial lake, but with the Ozarks appeal to it, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid. Yeah, <laughs> if we can use that for a lake but, terminology. Yeah. But really, so, really fast to add on to your point here, an area like this is probably really smart to try to dial in for practice if you know there's mm -hmm. fish around. Because if you find find something like this and there's fish there that day one of practice you're going to have fish coming to you every single day yeah. moving back in those creeks. And that's yeah, so and depending on which way the wind blows too. So if the wind blows from the Southwest, I think that flooded timber side where we first pointed right out would be good because it's going to create a funnel yeah. and you're going to have a current seam going down that edge. Now, if you get an East wind, you might actually flip and fish the other side because you always right. want to fish yeah. where the current's pushing. But, right. but what stuck out to me is that little fork Creek right there. So that could be yeah. a prime spawning area right in here, depending Those on what that are lazy and don't want to go all the way back. Exactly. Yeah. So that whole shoreline is flooded timber and it's a quick access to deep water. And there's probably some flats on there. And then another part that really intrigues me too, is I love points that have quick um, contour lines to them. That's another really good pre-spawn winter area for those fish to get up on a point and use that as a channel but like a channel swing bring this up on google maps the whole flooded timber thing's got me curious yeah well, let's pull this up get this out of here so the, yep get that out of here interesting Oh, yeah, you can see there actually is a tree. You can almost see the tree right there. Where are you looking? So right right about where your cursor just was. Go back down. Here? Right. Yeah. That might be a tree. Can that's you a, zoom in more? That one's a boat, but that one might be a tree. That's a boat. That's a boat. That's a boat. <laughs> yeah. So you automatically know it's a good area because you have a boat on it already. So. Right. I wish <laughs> like, they, do they tell you when these pictures are taken? Uh, let's see. Bottom right, August. I don't so this know. is 2021 map data. Yeah, it does. But there's no way that's 2021. <laughs> no. <laughs> no shot. <laughs> but it, the greenery is very green, so I'm going to guess sometime late spring, maybe even summer. Right. Yeah, it's the timber thing got me interested. But going back to Navionics here. Um, in that pre-spawn time, I think it's really smart, kind of like how you mentioned that the fact of trying to spend some time trying to find areas where they're going to stage to move back mm -hmm. to spawn, because like we mentioned earlier, you're just going to constantly have fish coming to you versus if you take the approach of trying to say, find a, a main lake flat like this, where there's like a very elongated, massive point to it, graphing mm -hmm. it. And sure, you can find fish that are in their wintering holes. Uh, but at that point in time, if you find fish there, they want to practice. I would not bank on that because chances are those fish are going to be gone by the time it's day one of tournament. So if I had my boat breaking down this scroll back up a little bit, so go like north on the lake on that ledge. So ledge. right where that little creek is. Here? Nope. Right where ledge. you just were. So right where Shelbyville is by the E, where the creek bed is. Here? Yeah. So okay. if I had a boat after leaving the bridge, this would be one of the next areas that I would check because you have a creek mouth that's coming out. You, you can tell by the blue line on your graph. You have quick tapering contour lines by the island and running back into this pocket. 
and that's just a highway for pre-spawners. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't even bother with the ledge. I would look where that contour line gets steepest and how far back it goes and check if there's any structure there. There could be trees. There could be anything. But that creek bed goes all the way back. That could be a good place for there to be bait fish and for those fish to use as basically like a racetrack to move in and out from wintering grounds up to ready to spawn. And then behind that island, that could all be spawning flat. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Mm hmm because it has that deep water access though so could be this could on be, both sides i i wouldn't look for that first i look for that for a late spawn yeah oh i i don't disagree yeah, yeah. but for like a feeding pre-spawn area that i think those creek mouths on like the backside, even in front of the island can be good too because you have a couple yeah. little secondary underwater points <clears throat> oh 100 yeah yeah from a pre-spawn a pre-spawn standpoint i think that kind of covers and obviously you, what you can do with that. And if you're from the area, I mean, especially if, you know, on a day from a day one standpoint, right. F kind of let's backtrack here and get more organized with how we're approaching this. So we've been focusing on this Creek arm. Mm -hmm. Now I'll start us off here. And I'd like to hear your side from a boat, how long you think it'd take you for me to go check out the backs of these creeks from, I mean, where's the nearest launch here? I'm not even seeing a launch. <laughs> there might not be one. Might be able to put in at that bridge. Yeah, so it's okay. Yeah, let's use the bridge for example. If there is, if big if. Uh for me to check the uh check that out, this little arm right here that we spoke upon with that flooded timber, and to come back and try to get as deep as possible into these creeks, and then just to come back and check out the mouth of this, that's gonna take me a whole morning. Oh, that's probably sure. gonna take not me longer. Until noon. Yeah, to thoroughly check it out, that's gonna take me till noon. Obviously, there's there's telltale signs of, you know, when you can check out certain areas where you're like, okay, there's no way there's fish here, and then you just leave. Mm -hmm. But to thoroughly check it out, that's gonna take me a whole morning. From this bridge back into these creeks into this island that we we had spoken about with that creek bed, how long do you think that's gonna take you to build? It depends on how much time I spend on each spot. So if I'm really like getting diving deep without making a cast, I could probably mm -hmm. scan it all in. If I'm speed scanning, probably an hour and a half, I could do up, down, around. But um, me personally, when I find something good on a stretch I'm checking out, I like to stop and take a few casts after I scan it a couple times just mm -hmm. to see what I'm graphing and feel the bottom. Because sometimes if it, let's say it's like, a very dark clay lake, like a clay lake, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes that bottom structure kind of like blends in with itself. So it could look like mud clay and then you'll have some rock, but the rock could be roughly like a shale clay colored. You can't really tell when you're right. side scanning, but you can find those little sweet spots. And I mean, I'm decent with my graphs, but I'm not by far the best. Um, which is kind of funny that I smallmouth fish, but <laughs> it, you can kind of get away with some stuff in open water but when it comes to like lake scanning i look for hard stuff and then i'll fish around the hard stuff and mm -hmm. my biggest thing is if you have timber if you have rocks that's going to warm quicker than everything yeah. else and in pre-spawn those fish are going to be sucked to that so when i'm looking for pre-spawn stuff i'm looking for those sharp contours instant cover and where it's going to warm the fastest so i will boogie around till i find it's almost a water temp deal for me. I, I yeah, honest. I picture that first pre-spawn day where it's sunny and it gets hot, where it, you know, and the water temps aren't caught up, where those uh, literally uh, those flooded timbers are gonna be loaded. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they could, as the water gets into like that mid fifties, then all of a sudden you're gonna see them start pushing back into those creeks and not on the main lake as much. But that yep. being said, some of your biggest fish will still be caught main lake because they haven't moved up. Right. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, from a kayak standpoint or even from a boater standpoint, uh, what my next move from there, if I don't, if I don't find anything I like back in here, uh, I'll, I'll, let me take two standpoints. If I don't find anything I like out here, I'm going to more focus by this Island and there's more of this main lake point here to see if mm -hmm. I find fish that are still in wintering holes and then try to find those and move forward to see if they've progressed at all. Um, you know, but if you know I, what I really like, 
Pardon me. Yeah. I apologize. See this little roadbed here off to the left of your cursor? This? That is interesting to me because there's a hard point, right? right? Off, yeah, we'll With a shoal top it. and then a roadbed. So you have a hard spot, a traffic highway for those fish to follow on that old roadbed. So that point there, I bet has fish. Even though oh, it says a fish yeah. on it, that that is a juicy pre-spawn area to me because deep water deep. access. Yeah, that could be a wintering hole right there. So tight contours. So where I actually think I would position my boat on this is this little divot on the bottom little left of your cursor. I would actually probably focus there first because you have hard contours, a secondary point coming in, and then a hard point coming out. And that's where I bet those fish would be sitting, somewhere in there based on the wind. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Uh, that's something I would check out if I didn't like back in that creek. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't like what I saw, I'd be checking that out. I'd be checking out, let's see, right on this front side here. Because these are all staging points to get moving forward. I mean, these are all things that, and pretty much the way to approach it, kind of like exactly how you you put it is you're just gonna hop on your graph and you're gonna go looking for either hard spots or fish and if you don't i mean for me from a three-day standpoint on a kayak if i don't see something immediate like that i'm just gonna keep moving until i do find it mm -hmm. uh, i'm and not that, gonna try to force anything that might not be there or might be there uh because simply i don't have the time yeah um, it's fair in the standpoint of if i do find something i like out here I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive in a little bit, a little bit more, maybe spend another hour trying to divvy up some things, but not too much time. I'll go back to that bridge and I'm going to pull out and I'm going to go try to find somewhere else to launch and hit this Eastern Creek. That's very similar. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find something just like it. If not try to find better fish or maybe a plan B. Um, and then what I can do is basically with, with that, with that plan and finding, if that's, if they're deep in creeks, Maybe they're out on whichever one you find, right? If they're deep in the creeks getting ready to spawn or they are out main lake, what you can do from that is therefore design your practice structure throughout the rest of the week to hit different things that are very similar to see if you can find that better caliber of fish. And then on your, mm -hmm. so day two, try to find things very similar, run a lot of places. Then day three, try what I would do is maybe spend the first couple hours trying to find something new again but then use the rest of that day. If you don't have like a cutoff at a certain time, use the rest of that day going back to your plan A and trying to dive as further into it as you can. Absolutely. So my day two practice is completely designed off of what I do day one, right? So if day one, I am I find a couple things I like and all of a sudden I stick a big one, which nobody ever wants to stick a big one, but I, I stick a good one. Like let's call it a three and a it's half. It's a pounder. sweet feeling. <laughs> yeah. Stick a big one, and, and it's a three and a half pounder on day one. You have two days of practice. Now, if my day two plan was to run down to the southern end of the lake, right? I might scrap that and be like, okay, I'm going to take this area that I just figured out and expand on it more to try to find more little home run spots that I can circle for that one day tournament or two day tournament. <clears throat> right. And to be honest, like one of my absolute favorite pre-spawn baits, and I don't know if people will find me nuts for this or not, is a is a football jig. I have caught so many big ones in the spring throwing a football jig, just covering hard spots because mm -hmm. the crawfish are starting to come out. It mimics bluegill pretty well. And I just feel like it's a big fish bite bait. Like people will throw a jerk bait and move, move, move. I when it's pre-spawn, the jerkbait's great, but I think slowing down gets you way more big bites, personally speaking. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to agree with you from the standpoint of springtime, that pre-spawn. First thing, if I'm out deeper, yeah, I'm throwing a football jig. And going back to our podcast with Buddy Gross, those fish on the bottom are more aggressive fish. So it's, mm -hmm. if you're throwing a football jig and those fish are aggressive, it's not going to take long before you get one bite and you got that place kind of figured out. Exactly. Um but talking about going back in this creek, and this is actually a bait that I use throughout the year. It doesn't really matter. I mean, more in the fall, I probably won't just because fall generally from, from us, our standpoint, fall, they're, they're typically a lot deeper, at least from a northern standpoint. But if I'm going back in those creeks trying to find fish, I'm throwing a big mag draft. Cause, and granted, what I'm going to do too, I'm taking that treble hook off. 
uh, which our buddy Zach Hall, when I was throwing this around on Chick during practice back in November, he's like, why are you taking the hook off and that sort of thing? And it's like, because I don't want to catch as much as – You just want them to show themselves. Yeah, I, that's all I do is is that's the probably one of the best ways I've found to get big fish. I mean, granted, fish in general, but big fish to at least say, hello, I'm here, and mm-hmm. it can kind of help you put together some different clues. Now, yes, it does suck watching a giant come up and swallow it and you don't have a treble hook on. And then, obviously, if you don't catch them on tournament day, that's a big, well, that sucks. But you never know. It's just that off mm-hmm. chance. Uh, but, yeah, I'd go big mag, mag draft, and I agree on the football jig, especially when I'm targeting those deeper waters. So um, a very oh, underutilized pre-spawn bait, in my opinion, and this is what I do when I'm pre-spawn fishing, trap for fish to that. show themselves, a trap is a good one. I like a big bladed willow blade spinner bait. Mm, I do like that, too. When they're moving up, I like that mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. Because one, you can fish it slow enough because you got those big willow blades out. You can, you can fish it, it hover. slow enough. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can make it hover while reeling it slow, but and you can do all kinds of different things. You can get some big ones to show themselves on that too and not commit. So yeah. you it's yeah. it's kind of cool because you almost have a wave of shad that comes up when the big fish are t- when the females yep. make their move up because mm-hmm. they push that bait up. Yep. So that's what's so cool about it. It's something that not a lot of people do. Um, but I'm trying I, to think if there's any other thing we should mention for the pre-spawn before we move to the spawn. Spawn is actually spawn. I think is going to be a quick one, relatively on how we break that down. Any any last notes still on pre-spawn? No, um, like my whole thing with like the pre-spawn is it's difficult for me because I'm used to fishing the pre-spawn on Lake Erie. So it's this giant great lake. So I, I already have them mapped out. I don't even have to look at a map for it. I know exactly what they're doing, where they're going, and how because their routes are the same. So right. that's one thing I actually want to do this spring is get on a pre-spawn bite on a couple different lakes and see if we can figure out how they move. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and my pre-spawn from a, a kayak standpoint is going to be very similar to kind of how I approach spawn as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest with you, um, well, but, it's very similar. Yeah, well, it's for me. It's going to be if I have you know going back. We're using a three day reference uh, for those who may be joining in later or might have skipped ahead. We're using a three day reference for how we approach practice. So that day one, I'm basically going to try to figure out where the heck these fish are setting up and try to figure out what stage. Uh, obviously, water temps would be a big indicator, but trying to get a feel for where they are, giving getting actual evidence, putting your eyes on fish, whether on the graph or visual. Um, day two, trying to mimic what you found on day one, and then day three, trying to expand on your plan A. Uh, if you don't find anything day one, uh, keep looking day two. If you don't find anything day two, keep looking day three. Uh, it's just Hopefully one of those things somewhat, like, obviously, yeah. yeah, like obviously, what we're talking about is these are our structures, how we love to have practice goes that to go that way but as all tournament anglers know it never almost never goes that way no usually by the end of practice day two you're running around with your head cut off and all of a sudden you stumble on something you're like why didn't i look at this the whole time yeah and if (laughs) if practice does go ideal like that typically uh you probably blank on saturday (laughs) you're like i'm out (laughs) there's gone (laughs) so i mean and that's that's a big way I like to practice too. And I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with is when you find pre-spawn fish, it's more important to know where they're going than where they have been. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have to look for those tight contour lines because they're coming from deep water. And what are they looking for? They're looking for somewhere to eat, to get ready to spawn. So when you have those tight contour lines running up into a Creek mouth with a road bed, that's where they were. So where where are they going to go? And that's where you can expand on. So those mm-hmm. fish disappeared. Did it get warmer or did it get colder? On your yeah. so let's say we'll throw day one practice. It's fifty five degrees. Water temps fifty two. Day two, it's the same. But day three tournament day, all of a sudden temperatures drop and you get a snowstorm. Where are those fish going to go? So you have to have mm-hmm. a plan for almost. You almost have to look at the weather to figure out where those fish are going. Yeah. So you so you don't spin out come day three. And a, an interesting tidbit that Mikey had mentioned to us when we had him on for Monday Night Live was a majority of the time, if those fish start moving up to a staging area and you do get a big cold front like that, 
try to check areas around their wintering hole that might be similar because chances are they're not going to go back to their wintering hole. Uh, so you got to kind of find something that's in between, which can be kind of difficult. It, it is, I mean, I think that's probably the hardest scenario to ever try to uh, adjust to is mm-hmm. staging fish that are being pushed off. I, that is probably one of the most difficult scenarios I think there is in fishing. Oh yeah, because it's gonna, it will spin you out. And it spins me out almost every time. I think it, and I think it spreads them out too. Mm-hmm. Because me and Bailey, we come from big natural lakes. We don't have reservoirs, so when when we target like pre spawners, we know where they are. We know where they're going because it's pretty easy to figure it out on a spawning lake. I mean, mm-hmm. on a natural lake, but when they disappear, it's like. I'm fishing six foot deep here. The spawning is there behind me. There's great gravel bars, but behind me it's 45 foot deep, like 30 yards away. Like, what do I do? <laughs> like, where did they go? And they just disappear. And then all of a sudden the next day it gets warm again and they're back. It's like yep. the most insane dumb thing. <laughs> yeah. And most chances is probably they just literally, you know, you found them staging in five foot. They're probably in seven. Yeah. Like, it might be just as simple as that. Uh, it's pretty much just just work your way back. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's really that's all I could dumb it down to. Um, but I think moving on to spawn time, you know, say you found these fish. Well, I'm clicking on the wrong screen. Uh, so say we found these fish right on the bridge. They're staging, moving back. You know, they could spawn in that creek arm. But I mm-hmm. think what I would also look for is trying to find some of these subtle flats. Yep. Or something like back in here these little bays where they can, it's almost all flat water. It's going to be really warm areas that they're going to go and get up on bed where they can find the near structure and do their deed. Um, if you find them in that, it is super easy to replicate that. I think you can just literally exactly. go around the lake, find spawning flats areas where they're, they're going to be comfortable to have well, structure to, to get on. Just from like right there alone, just looking at that one shallow area, I see one, two, three, four, five, possibly six spots I would go to mm-hmm. to try to find spawners again. But it's all based on that bottom composition. Right. There is a sneaky little area, though. Down here, you see where these pin buoys are off that one point? If you go across the lake there, you have a main lake down. Like, keep going. So you see those pin buoys on that main lake point? You went a little too far. Oh, so, yeah. yep, right there, go right across the lake. So, yep, see that little secondary point right there? You could have some main lake spawners in that area. Interesting. Just now tiny I'm little... look for that. No. Yeah. If I find them doing that too, like, I'm basically. That's one of the hardest with... things to pattern. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah, definitely. And I think the biggest thing to, to note on that, at least for, for, and I'm sure Andy can agree here. If you find them doing that, they are up getting up on beds like they are on beds. Cover as much water as possible and take notes on your graph. Take as many notes as you can to reminder of what fish is there. Like if you find big fish, you need to mark them. Uh, and I know like certain guys with small mouth will do is they'll catch them, mark them. And then on the their graph with their waypoint, they will put the weight of the fish. So it's, it's something different. But obviously like large mouth, you don't want to do not do not mm-hmm. try to catch that fish. Uh, tomorrow he'll either not be there or he won't eat at all exactly so you gotta just cover as much water as you can mark where the fish are at put waypoints on them uh and then at least for me with my mindset what i try to do is like if i find a fish that you know if i find a lot on beds i'll take one that i don't think i'll need whatsoever and just work through a couple baits and get a comfort for bed fishing crack one in the face make me feel better mentally and then obviously just keep moving on, try to find mm-hmm. more like that. And then, you know, if you find that day one, I mean, good grief, you're golden for the rest of practice. Because yeah. if you find them north like that, chances are south, they're just going to be a little bit behind. So you're going to have them for tournament day. Yep. Just keep trying to find them. Just move. I think they're going to just keep coming to you too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And just, just keep trying to, I mean, if I'm, now to, to put it in a kayak standpoint, Obviously, you can't cover water as good or as efficiently as a boat and if with a trolling motor. I think a trolling motor could probably cover water a lot better than a kayaker because, one, you have leverage. You're, mm-hmm. you're, obviously, you can stand up. 
now that I'll give in, there are certain kayaks with motors that you can stand up and do such thing. So if you have those, you're at an advantage. Uh, but like for say, take my kayak for your standpoint, a PA, PA 12, where I have the pedals. I ha- I can't pedal and stand at the same time. So chances are I'm going to have my paddle out and I'm using it like a paddle board so I can stand and move. So I'm not sitting, standing, sitting, standing. Whereas you, you can click a button with your toe and you can go and look for all these fish. And I'm personally, for me, I'm not even going to be fishing. Yeah. I think what I, I think, well, I take that back. There's chances if depending on water clarity, I'm not going to be fishing. If it's water, it's a little bit dingier, but I can obviously see in front of me. I'm going to just keep throwing this mag draft because you might get a random big follower and then you can kind of break down. Okay. Where's her bed? Mm-hmm. So it's obviously up to your variable there, but we'll, I mean, beyond that too, like if that's the case, I'm trying to put in as many different launches as I can cover as many different areas to try because you never know when you might stumble on just some freak giants that you already know that you're probably going to go there first yep on current day so like with the boat what i'll do is if i find one fish on a bed right if i'm just going down the shoreline i find one fish on a bed i'm going to mark it and then i'm going to zoom in on my graph which i'm already zoomed in probably but i'm going to look and figure out what what i just marked that fish on and then i'm going to zoom out and go to another part of the lake, let's say a mile and a half away, somewhere relatively close. And I'm just going to start working down the lake or up the lake to find similar looking stuff. And then I'll just shoot over there real fast, get up on the trolling motor or idle it and side scan to see if I can see the beds, depending on what kind of vegetation there is. So if it's just hard rock bottom, I might not even get up on the deck and trolling motor around. I might actually just graph and see if I can graph the beds on my side scan. You're talking from a small mouth standpoint? Or a large mouth. If there's if they're just spawning on rock, I mean, and there's no vegetation. Oh, right. You can you can scan beds. What's the deepest you totally totally random? What's the deepest deepest large mouth you found spawning? Probably like five, five, six foot. Yeah. I don't think I found one deeper than that before. No. It, they don't I don't think they spawn much deeper because they want like the warmest water like i i've caught four and a half the six pound largemouth on beds and six inches of water i feel like because they just want to be warm they want the most sun. oh that's another thing too while we sidetrack i um i pay attention to what side of the lake gets more sun so sometimes uh, yeah. the, sun, the sun always rises in the east so I am always, when I'm looking for spawning fish, I am always going to the opposite bank. So I will always start on the west bank because you're more likely to have spawners on the west bank because it's warmer, longer during the day than the east bank. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think what, especially during that time, a really good thing to pay attention to is moon phase. Oh, for sure. Moon phase yeah. is huge. Oh, yeah. So if the water temp is 60 degrees, well, it's called 65 because I think largemouth love to spawn in like that 60 to 65 degree range in the north. Maybe a little, like, would you say 60 to 65 or 58 to 65? Once I really good is when I really find them on bed. They'll be moved up in the late 50s, like the higher 50s, but. I have seen a few largemouth on beds at 58, but I think it's because the day before it was like seven, it was like 80 degrees. And the water might have warmed up to like 61, 62, and right. they just never left. But um, that water temp is huge. You might have 57 degrees on that east bank, but 65 on the west. Right. So, yeah. So I think transitioning into summer, uh, obviously these fish are going to pull back out. Uh, I think there could be a period of time where you can get back on that bridge and have fish coming to you as they're leaving. Yeah. Uh, as you could with you know these little humps here, you know, this island. Um, I think this island, as you're that spawn transitioning out, could be a great place because not only are you going to have fish that are spawned that are going to come on the steep break, this ledge right here, mm-hmm. but you're also going to have late spawners in the backside. Like, and- <clears throat> absolutely, yeah. But I mean, for me, if it's dead summer, like you know, late July, early August, uh, I'm going to get on, I'm gonna get on the graph, and I'm going to cover as much water as possible just following contours trying to find structure trying to find fish 
getting on these ledges that are here. Just trying to find fish because that's where, you know, obviously there's going to be fish up shallow. Uh, but for myself and my strengths, I excel out deep. And that's where I'm going to stay within my strengths where mm -hmm. I can, I would imagine, you know, Andy, like yourself, your first motion is probably going to be go up shallow, especially if there's structure up shallow. Because I feel like you're more of a, when it comes to largemouth, you're more of a shallow anger, angler, I should say. I, I like fishing grass, but I'm not a deep ledge type fisherman for largemouth. My comfort zone is... You're a junk guy, I think. Yeah, I mean, I can catch them anyway. I, if I have to skip frogs underneath trees, I'll go skip a frog in tree. And if they're not eating that, I'll throw a jig and I'll work my way out to like six to eight foot. But I'm always... My strength is target fishing, trees, docks, but I can fish grass. Right. So this looks I, really interesting to me. Total, totally didn't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> no, you're good. Look at these river channels that are coming in through here. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, and like, so that river channel, but then you have a giant main lake flat. Yeah. If you can get structure off that or even off this, this southern point here. If you can find structure on that flat, uh that would be money uh but also i mean i think early morning there's definitely got to be a window where those those fish can be pushing up on bait up shallow on this flat so top waters chatter baits traps swim baits whatever i have you big old spook yeah give me a spook bite <laughs> i think yeah i think a top water is the best way to cover water there because there's got to be fish that push up on that uh but like off of here i mean midday i mean a lot of these fish, what they could do is push up onto the shallow area, push those ba uh, that bait up, and then they have that deep water right here on this ledge where they can push off that and set up for the rest of the day. And they don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. With largemouth, they're lazy. From yeah. a smallmouth standpoint, they might just literally roam that flat all day long. They could, especially if it's a water clarity thing. If it's clear, they'll stay there all day. Oh, yeah. No doubt. I'm trying to think. I mean, bait-wise, summer is completely different for me summer naturally is a tougher time to catch fish mm -hmm. so uh, i'm probably gonna be throwing everything in the bank i'm gonna have a lot of rods and i'm probably gonna be switching up a lot until you kind of start dialing it in and get advice but first thing oh. i'm the top water top 100 if you find it's a good top water bite i mean i'm taking hooks off i don't know are you are you a lay off the fish kind of guy take hooks off that sort of thing no. No? Why? I'm because I try I try to find schools of fish that I when I summer fish, I don't look for one and twosies. I try not to look for ones and twosies when I'm practicing. I try to find size. So if I'm catching a bunch of one pounders, right? So if you go into an area and you know that lake has thousands of bass in it, right? We'll, right. we'll call it hundreds of thousands, and you go into this area and it's got grass. If, let's just say you you cut the hook off of a jig, right, and you're flipping in there and you're getting bit. When you go to pull up on that fish in that grass, you're not going to know if it's a one-pounder or a four-pounder as you're pulling him because he's going to sometimes hit that grass, and he might feel bigger than he actually is. And then you go back and turn him a day with hooks, and all you catch are 14-inch fish. And you're just like, ah. Oh, I thought I had big bites here in practice. So I like, I don't burn the house down per se, but if I'm getting bit by like a 14 incher and a 14 incher and a 14 incher, yeah, those are quality tournament fish, but those 14 inches tend to bite more than the big ones. So if I go through an area and I catch 14 inch or 14 inch or 14 inch or four pounder, then I'm like, okay, I can back off of here. Cause now I know there's a big fish here. Yeah, but if I yeah, if I just yeah. keep going through and I catch a twelve inch or twelve inch or twelve inch, I'll just burn it down to see what's going on there. And if it's just all twelve inches, I won't even go back there during the tournament unless I need a fifth fish. Right. So yeah, when, something you kind of see if it is a a class hanging with class deal, or mm -hmm. if maybe you just need to weed the room with which. Yeah. I'm the same way too. I, I'll take that. I'll take it back to a standpoint of if I'm catching small fish, I don't really care. I'm not going to yeah. take it off. But if I find an area that has bigger fish and I get a bigger fish to, to eat, I'll probably I'll try to catch one more and then I'm taking hooks off and then I'm leaving. So the way I practice 99% of the time in the summer, and this is where I think I'm different than a lot of people, my strength at fishing is a drop shot. 
So when I am practicing, I want to know what's living in that area. So that's why I fish a drop shot. Because when you throw mm -hmm. it in that weed patch, if there's bluegill or perch around, you're going to get that, 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 right? So now you can coordinate your flipping baits for when you go back in the tournament to what possibly is nibbling on your drop shot. And then all right. of a sudden you stick a, a four pounder on it. You're like, okay, there's really big fish here and they're not afraid to eat a finesse bait. Can they eat a big bait? So during tournament day, I'll go back knowing I can catch them on a drop shot, but I'll try to get more big bites by fishing that bigger bait, like a jig or a beaver. I am, I love power fishing, but I like power fishing with a Texas rig or a jig. That's my favorite mm. way. Yeah. I'm trying to think what other factors we can talk about with summer. Uh, well, so, so summer, summer practice strategy from a kayak. Basically, I'm trying to max maximize as much time as I can on the graph to see if there's a pattern going on with, the, with what the fish are doing uh, because there's a certain bodies of water, certain times where it might be a certain depth that they're sitting in on that same contour. So you can run multiple mm -hmm. contours and they're going to be in that specific depth. Uh, but yeah, just for the most time, for the most part, day one, I'm probably not going to fish very much. I'm probably going to spend a lot of time if they're on ledges, they're on those deep breaks. I'm just going to graph as much as possible. And then if I do find something, I'll spend a little bit of time trying to go back and fish. Day two, I'll probably try to maximize on that if I think that there's a lot of potential. Uh, but if not, a day two is going to be another day kind of similar to that where I'm just going to spend more time fishing. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the graph, but if nothing's panning out, I'm going to make a push shallow and see if I can't figure out uh, maybe if they're on the bank. Because, I mean, like with time and time again, a lot of guys have shown not only in just kayak tournaments, but like, you know, like John Cox, obviously, is an example that everyone uses. There's fish on the bank. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to go a little bit differently. I actually don't rely on my graphs nearly as much in the summertime. So <clears throat> I'll kind of go through like my pre-practice, practice leading up to the tournament. So what I do the night before I go out for day one practice and then day two. So the night before, I'm going to be looking at Navionics. I'm going to try to find underwater points. I don't like fishing main honey holes on lakes. Community holes catch fish, but I like to find those secondary community holes that are like secondary points that really like probably the only the local hammers know about because they're the ones that are always looking at their maps. So, and then what I'll do is I'll find 10 to, well, let's go up. Let's say 20 to 40 areas, depending on the lake size, because I have an outboard and I can run around like a madman. <laughs> but um, I will just try to find secondary points and then get in. Um, I'll work my way out in. So I'll get, I'll try to find the weed edge, right? So first, the first thing I'm looking for is the quality of weeds. So if I pull up to an area and I see slime, I already forget about it. And then I'll move on to the next area and the next area until I find really good weeds. And then when I find the really good weeds, I will mark it on my graph in a different code than the waypoint I've already put in. So I know, okay, there's good weeds here. And then I'll keep circling around. And then what I'll do, the next lap, I'll bypass all those areas with slime weeds and I'll go in on those good marks and see how far in the good weeds go and to see what those weeds look like. So am I, are they sparse? Are they matted up? Are they chunks it is there a rock in there i almost will because i have a hot foot right so i can't really do it too well but i'll almost like lean myself up so i can look over the side of my boat to see exactly what i'm looking at because when you have weeds it's hard to scan side scan in those weeds i i have 2d on almost all the time when i'm inside of weeds because i just want to know how deep i am right and then all of a sudden like you hit you so you're going through your weeds this is one of my favorite little things to do when I'm going through weeds, I actually try to find blowouts from props that are leaving the shoreline. Because mm -hmm. when you find those blowouts, <clears throat> you can almost go through those blowouts. And if you work out in, as you're going through, you might find a depth change in that blowout, right? So if you're going out to in, it's like eight foot, eight foot, eight foot, six, five, six, five, four, six, four, three. All of a sudden you're like, oh, there might be a channel there. And then right. you can go in right. and kind of break out that area. And that's usually where those bigger fish and that grass is going to live because from all the weeds dying in sediment, that 
usually that blowout is a hard spot. Right. So when you get that blowout in the weeds, that's probably in that general vicinity is where the mass conglomerate of fish is going to be. Interesting. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's super interesting. I think it, summer wise, it is advantage boat because mm -hmm. you have to cover a lot more water. Uh, and it takes a lot more time because obviously those fish are so spread out. Uh, so I think, you know, from a kayak standpoint, it is much difficult in the summer versus a spawn or pre-spawn. Absolutely. So now the reverse, that's inland lake. If I'm on the Great Lakes, I'm out. I almost don't even fish for my entire practice. I just scan mm -hmm. because I can tell just by looking at my graphs what size quality fish I have beneath me. And yeah. uh, when it's late summertime, I don't look for groups of fish. Why? Because groups of fish, when it comes to Great Lakes smallmouth, tend to be the same size fish. So you're just looking for rogues? I look for rogue groups. Like, when I'm saying groups of fish, I'm looking for one to three fish. Hmm. Because naturally they're going to be bigger because they're not within that group. That kind of goes back on Benjamin Nowak's theory. He goes, this past year, he tried to test it out. And obviously, his kid got in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but he had mentioned that he thinks that bigger fish aren't with they're the alone. school. They're just off of the school. And chances are, if you find them, that they're going to be a lot of that. They're going to be that larger six, six and a half caliber fish. Mm -hmm. Have you found that to be true? Total yes. tangent. Yes. There you, there you go, Northern folks. You just gotta and you just got some juice. I'm not gonna tell you what body of water that I established that on, but I can tell you I had a couple days over the past few summers that I was scanning and I would find a lot of fish and I would drop on them and they'd be all two and a half pounders. And I would be like, Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. I'm catching them one after another, but the these fish come tournament day aren't going to help me. Mm -hmm. So I would literally just try to get off of the group slightly. And all of a sudden I'd be like, Oh, there's a big one. And it'd be a solo mark. And I would drop down and be like, it's either going to be a sheephead or a small mouth. Mm -hmm. But you can tell the difference. If you're really good with, if you're decent with your electronics, you can tell the difference between a sheephead and a small mouth. Mm -hmm. The sheephead is going to be a long, a long elongated arc. On your 2D, a small mouth is actually almost going to look like lasagna. Mm -hmm. So the way they're moving in the water, they break up a lot better. And sheephead, if you find one big sheephead, there's usually seven or eight more of them there. And all of a sudden, you'll <clears throat> if you find the small mouth, it'll be one lasagna, then maybe two lasagnas like stacked right on top of each other. And you drop down and be like, oh, there's a five pounder. <laughs> or if you find that big, weird, elongated arc, you drop down on it, big sheephead. So if you're uh, scanning Great Lakes, there's your little tidbit, hot take mm -hmm. of the day on how to tell the difference between a sheephead and a smallmouth. There you go. There's your nugget. <laughs> 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 let's see. Let's let's transition to our last topic of the day, and that's fall, which I think oh. is probably the most difficult. I hate fall fishing, <laughs> unless fall. I'm out Lake Erie. <laughs> Fall sounds simple, but the actually trying to find those fish is so difficult. Like, they just roam. They roam I think for me, roam. Like, taking this this body of water in particular, you're gonna try. You're basically gonna try to find where their wintering hole is gonna be, and and see if you can try and catch them on their way there. Uh, before it becomes almost too cold. Like I feel like Illinois is like a New York where it gets too cold to go after those fish, and you obviously get hard ice. I think like something like this, where it's going to be at the end of this point, 27 foot, you, know, you have 32 out here, where they're going to be bundled up and bundled up pretty dang good. Uh, something like these bigger main lake points where I think they're going to be off of it. That's where I would be going with my boat. I would be burning my entire tank of gas, running every main lake point from like six foot to 30 foot. Mm -hmm. And just scanning, 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 looking for that one little magic yeah. spot on like four points out of the 150 you'll run on that day and hope you catch five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like something <laughs> like this, another another main lake point yep. where it comes out. It's in 39 foot right here. You have a pinch point for them. So if you do have wind ripping through that it creates current breaks, 
And obviously yeah. you have that main river channel that's at deep water access that probably almost acts like a wintering hole for them. But you have multiple different pinch points. You have multiple different main lakes. They're, they're going to be around there somewhere. And and then they'll throw you the entire weird curveball that all of a sudden it's like it should be the fall pattern. I should be running main lake points. And then all of a sudden you pull in the back of a creek and they're all the way in the back. It's like, what are you doing there? Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. Go home. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and then the next day they're gone. Right. But it could be so con- – fall is a very, very confusing time of year. Probably shouldn't take any of Andy and I's advice. No. Uh, <laughs> Unless you want to go this. small. This is probably where I go first. This is probably the biggest main lake point that I've seen on this lake. Right, look, look at this. That is probably the biggest main lake point that I have seen. Yeah, it's, that's – They're going to be on that somewhere because this has 49 foot. Yeah. See, I'd actually probably go over. You have these three main lake points down here, so you yeah. have that underwater hump, but it's a point because it comes because it comes off of that one. You have breaks that I would probably fish those because it runs back into creeks, and you never know what the shad are doing. So they right. could be back in their creeks, but they're smallmouth. I'm gonna come over here and check out these little shoals because <laughs> right. they're probably all over them. This is the toughest time of year, in my opinion, as a kayak angler. <laughs> because you're running so much stuff and obviously time is of the essence. So, you know, locations on where you're putting in, where you're checking out is very crucial within that three day span, depending on the size of the lake. Uh, that's always a variable, but I don't look like this. That's vast. I mean, it's, you have a lot of decisions to make on where you're going to focus your time looking for these fish, because it's not going to be a put in start fishing type of deal. Very rarely is the fall going to be like that, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, it's just going to be one of those things where I'm just going to run around, find as many fish as I can, try to find multiple schools within a certain area. That way, you know, if one or two are gone, I have something as a backup. So hopefully they're there. Mm-hmm. Um, and me talking about bait, it's pretty much I'm going to have an A-rig in my hand the entire time. A-rig or a swim bait. Yeah. I mean, another cool little tool that might work really well that time of year is um, an underspin as well, depending mm. on what the forage is. Um, but you also can't count out a lipless. You can't count out a deep diving crankbait just because literally the fall for me, every tournament I fish in the fall after like October, all five of my fish, if it's a large month lake, will come on five different baits because they right. just change the flavor of the day so many times. Yeah, fall fall is very, very tricky. But that late fall when they're going to get in the wearing holes can kind of actually be really easy because mm-hmm. um, they're, they're really not going to move anywhere, to be honest with you. But the kind of that kind of really breaks it down. Obviously, fall, we didn't go into too much of depth because obviously it can be pretty difficult. And I'm not a huge advocate, uh, acknowledgeable, I should say, on fall just yet. I mean, this past fall was the first fall I could really dive into to fishing the fall and figure out some northern fish but um it's 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 very tricky because i mean obviously it's one that you want to cover as much water because fall is obviously dropping temps cooling temps those fish are getting tighter uh and the tighter those fish are the less areas of the water that they're going to be which means there's less places those fish are going to be at which means it's more water that you have to cover which in a kayak is very difficult um Versus a boat, which can cover a lot of ground. Okay. And it's not much more of covering, like, say, like, let me put a nice share screen back up here. It's not much more of, say, you know, I'm going to launch and I'm going to go cover this point. I, I'm I, I'm fairly confident that I could graph this point in almost as much time as you could idle over it. Probably. Granted, I'm not, granted, I'm not going to do it as fast, but say I want to I want to graph this point and then I want to go across and graph the north side of it. You can be there in seconds. It's going to take me five, ten minutes. Yeah. At least. And if I say I want to go from east to west, which is triple the amount of time, that's going to take me 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, depending on how long that run is, where it's going to take you a minute. Yeah. Just way that's more. That's so difficult about it. Yeah. It's it's tough. It really is. But it's, it's I think, in general, uh, kind of to sum everything up, uh, obviously there's an advantage – being in a boat due to your mobility as we spoke on earlier. But in that, in that saying, there's an emph- there's an added emphasis on the decisions that you make in a kayak because it's kind of a 
a live and die by what you're deciding to do. It is a, Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose this. I'm only going to have a plan A and B. I don't have time for plan C because by the time plan C is in effect, tournament's over. Yep. Because you're just limited. So where I could have an A, B, C, D, and E, and then if I have to go to F, I'm just going home. I mean, I'll finish today, but I know I'm going home with my tail tucked between my legs because yeah. when you get to – usually once you start getting to plan D, you know it's bad. If you get to F, you might as well just forget it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think at, at that point, it's just you need to drop everything you're doing and go for something you have not done and pick up a bait you've not thrown for a long time or ever. Mm-hmm. At that point, just go experiment. Go like Just go fun fish. Yeah. Get back to your strengths, pull out your confidence bait box, and just start picking something apart that looks fishy that probably should have them, and the chances are they'll probably end up catching one. It's just, are there more than one there? Right. <laughs> yeah. And th- th- that's – so you kind of went on the, the opposite side of what I said. So, like, I I like to go back to my strengths, but there's times where, like – Chances are I'm probably already mm-hmm. fishing my strengths and I'm just going to do something wild and just do something completely new. Yeah. I, it must be a mental refresh. Even if it's, I'm only going to do it for 20 minutes, it might be a refresh and I can go back to doing what I'm else. You know what my refresh is? And it, this is kind of ridiculous. If everything is going wrong and I'm at F, I literally park the boat in the middle of the lake, sit down, eat a sandwich, drink my water, and then go look at my graph and be like, what the hell do I do next? <laughs> And then usually I'll just be like, all right, I'm going to go find some trees or I'm going to go fish some docks near deep water. And usually you can scrap out a bite or two. If I'm at that point, you see me flowing in the middle of the lake, don't talk to me because I am not in a good mood. <laughs> so- <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Let's see. Let me look. I think we pretty much touched on everything. Obviously, time management is different. Baits are pretty much relatively similar. Um yeah, it pretty much it dulls down to what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, how you want to break it down. Do you want to just find fish? Do you want to find areas and find er- areas that are similar? Or do you want to find a pattern? Like maybe it's just a certain pattern that you're going with and you're just going to kind of run new water on tournament day or every day. I mean, who knows? It's just kind of how you make of it. Uh, obviously, the, these examples aren't going to fit everyone that could be listening to this, but it's kind of a good mold I would I would put. Because uh, Andy and I aren't crazy tournament anglers. We're not, you know, obviously not the best. Uh, obviously not the best. Um, <laughs> more me than, than Andrew. Um, but we do think that we have a common understanding of how to approach it, um, which hopefully you guys can take tidbits from. Um, if you disagree or agree and you want to talk about it, put it down in the comments. Reach out to us on social media. Uh, Andy and I are going to try to put out a lot more videos kind of discussing about this Um I think some of the bigger tournaments we're going to do is we're going to sit down and have some recaps and kind of talk about our game plans and what we do and why we did it. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoy that. If you have any questions, again, put it down in the comments. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Andy, do you have anything left for the folks before we sign off tonight? Always feel free and ask questions. It's not a burden to me. I usually answer pretty quick. I know Bailey's usually pretty good about it too. We are here. I work on my phone, so I'm literally always on this thing. Yeah. We are here for everyone listening. How old you are does not matter. We will try to help you catch fish. And that's our purpose. So never hesitate, never be afraid. Because if you go and look at like YouTube comments or social media, we respond to literally everything. So unless you're Forrest Buckingham, then I just don't want to see Yeah, Forrest, Zach, you guys can go, you know where, but you'll probably (laughs) listen all the way through. So. They're probably the only yeah. two that are listening this deep. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you don't yeah. have any comments, if you have no comments versus the tournament practice strategy, if you are this deep, I am relatively curious. I challenge you to comment down there because yeah, I'm just really this, deep. Deep. this just deep. Put this deep. Yeah. But, um, okay. But maybe don't put that. That's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm this deep. <laughs> but yeah, just just comment just really fast. Comment if you're actually this far in the show and you're still listening. Because I think I'll, that would make my day if I heard if I seen some comments. People are at this far, but mm-hmm. uh, I think that's gonna wrap it up for today. Uh, I have one more day of work tomorrow, and then we're wrapping. I got the car already all rigged up, and we're headed south on Thursday. So when you're listening listening to this, chances are it is a Wednesday. Uh, yeah, tomorrow morning I will be 
running to Tennessee, and I'm very excited. We're going to be putting out some travel vlogs, and I'm going to also put out try to put out some fishing videos. So try. Hopefully, you find some fish. Heck yeah, you'll find them. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be in some incredible company. So, yeah. yeah. Friday is going to be a lot of fun fishing with Caleb Bell, Mr. Bass Quest, uh, who's been on some freaking giants. Uh, and also Mr. Alex Rudd. If you guys aren't following those folks already, definitely go check them out. Uh, it sounds like we're all going to be filming on Friday. So it's going to be a fun time. And then Alex and I are going to go on a river float in the kayaks on Saturday. Which yeah. that is going to be a lot of fun because I don't get to fish current a lot. So I'm and it's your inaugural run on the uh, the new Hobes. It is. It'll be the first time on the new Hobie, which I'm very excited about. So mm -hmm. the Hobie is does not get to test the waters in New York just yet. It is going to run and it's going to touch Tennessee first before anything else. So oh, I am true. excited for it. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a blast. So without further ado, folks, for PBs was... and everybody have a great night. Yeah. PBs please uh, <laughs> as always folks appreciate appreciate you guys tuning in we'll see you guys on friday with mr craig die by the way we have to announce that craig died another kayak angler we'll spring this topic up with him but yeah as always folks see you guys later